Oh boy, plant friends, I am so excited to finally have a deep dive into this set of plants, snake plants, that I think is completely underrated. Man, I've always loved the snake plant. If you've been listening to this podcast, you'll hear me give it little shout outs in different conversations. And we're so lucky to be joined by Chris Satch, repeat Bloom Grow guest and botanist, for a wonderful exploration of these plants that are often called low light tolerant. They're often thrown in dark corners, in dusty offices, in bathrooms with no windows due to their notoriously hardy personalities. But plant friends, there is so much more to this beautiful collection of plants than just their freaking ability to survive. They are structural. Their leaves come in the most mesmerizing shapes. I think they are one of the most giftable plants out there because not only are they low light tolerant, but they actually thrive in bright light. So no matter who you are gifting, whatever their light situation is, a snake plant will likely be able to handle it. Chris and I dive into this, but the fact that these plants are called low light loving or low light tolerant is a bit of a plant myth because they really do thrive in the sun. So plant friends, I'm starting a campaign to get snake plants on windowsills and in the highlight areas that they deserve, okay? Okay. So welcome to this passionate episode where the humble snake plant finally gets its chance to step into the sunlight and the spotlight on Blue Mango Radio. Hey, plant friends. I feel so goofy with that intro. I'm so passionate about the humble snake plant, but man, I'm excited to finally have an episode dedicated to one of my absolute favorite types of plants. Chris and I are giving you a really efficient episode. It's a lot of information and a really fun conversation, so I hope you enjoy it. If you do enjoy it, please take a minute to give a review on your preferred podcast player. Those reviews help Bloom and Grow Radio reach as many listeners as humanly possible. So... I'm thrilled to welcome our dear friend, botanist, repeat guest of Bloom and Grow Radio. He's been joining me for deep dives on plant science and plants since like episode four of the podcast, Chris Satch. He's known as the NYC plant doctor or botanic tonic on Instagram, and we have such a fun conversation. So without further ado, here is Chris. Chris, welcome back to Bloom and Grow Radio. I don't even know what number repeat appearance this is for you. <laughs> <laughs> it's so great to be back. It's so great to be here and see you again. I know, I know. I've been wanting to do an episode on snake plants for years. Snake plants are definitely my favorite fam, favorite type of plant. I think they're the most undercelebrated plant in the house plant parent collection. And when I decided I wanted to do one, I know you'd be my guy to do a deep dive on them. So thanks for joining me today. Yeah. So great to be here. And like, I'd love to talk about snake plants. There's like snake plants are like one of those things that like you see them everywhere. So you kind of don't think about them, but then like, there's actually a really interesting stories behind them. Totally. And I think they're wonderful for several reasons. They're giftable because since they're low and high light tolerant, whoever you're gifting it to, like realistically, it'll probably not die in whoever's home that you're gifting it to. And there's such a wide variety of them too. You could have a whole collection of just Sansevieria, Dracaena, whatever we're calling them. So actually that's perfect place to launch off. So we're going to dive into snake plant, everything, care, history, all the goods. So I feel like before we dive into the care of snake plants, I don't even know how to really refer to the snake plant by its Latin name anymore, because I know that there's been kind of controversy isn't the right word, but there's been a lot of shifts happening with how snake plants are supposed to be addressed. So when I became an enthusiast, I learned that snake plants are the Latin name Sansevieria. And in the last five years of me being a plant lady, now they're Dracaena instead of Sansevieria. And there's been some sort of re- categorization of them. So can you give us a little bit of insight into kind of why that happened and answer what should we be calling snake plants these days? Yeah, no, that I think that's a really great question. And I'll start off by saying scientists are always doing research. Scientists are always, you know, looking at things in a different way. And so the classification schemes have changed over time. You know, previously when you and I were first learning about plants, when they classified plants in, you know, whether it's the APG system or the Cronquist system or whatever, they classified plants with some genetics and some morphology taken into account. And nowadays it's trending towards just genetics, but that complicates things. 
because your genetic answer might not reflect your morphological answer, if that makes sense. So like things could be very, very closely related, but look totally different, right? Because the small variance that they do have makes them different. Like, you know, for example, I've never seen a Sansevieria that looks like a tree and a Dracaena, which looks like a tree. I've never seen that look like, you know, leaves sticking out of the ground. So, and for them to come together is really just that paper that came out that kind of shook the world and pulled it all back together. That's just one paper. There are plenty of other papers that are coming out to either support it or refute it. To some respect, classification is a little arbitrary. While there is math involved, it is a little arbitrary in the fact that, you know, depending on what your philosophy is, do you say that an organism is a separate species or genus if it's 2% different, if it's 3% different in genetics, if it's 5% different in genetics? Like, where is that line? That line is kind of, you know, drawn in the sand. It's a little arbitrary. So, yeah. So is it that Sansevieria, the snake plants, are now under the umbrella of Dracaena? Is that what happened? It's technically right now, according to Q, it's considered a synonym, which means it's not wrong to call them Sansevieria still. Okay. There is a concept of synonym. So it's a synonym. So they're of the same family. They're of the same genus. They they basically of the same mush, genus. Sorry, they mush them together. They mush them together. They They're mush like, them okay, together. Okay, exactly. Now, do I think they should be mushed together? No, I think that you know the morphology is just too consistently different. I will never see a snake plant turn into a tree one day. I will never see a dracaena not be a tree. Like just just as an arbitrary example. So I think that that should be taken into account. And I know that there will be people who counter me that say, you know, oh, well, the environment influences morphology. And I'll say, well, the environment influences genetics too. We have some, a concept called DNA methylation, but that's another topic for another day. So basically though, at the end of the day, they're synonyms. So now they're interchangeable. You can call what we know as snake plants, mother-in-law's tongue, whatever else you want to cast iron plant. We've known them as Sansevieria, but now some people are going to categorize them as Dracaena. It's very interesting. Yeah. And I can tell you from working in the hort industry that Sansevieria will never go away. Like they will still refer to them. Yeah. And they've been referred to in all the books that I have from the 70s. They're Sansevieria, yeah. you know, like it's so interesting how those can change. But I don't want to dive too deep into that because I really want to just start celebrating the actual plant and not the name and what to call them. Because we'll call them snake plants for this conversation, even though I like to know the Latin. So let's talk about this genus, where do we find them in real life, in nature? So if you Google the range of Dracaena, which is what they are now, you'll get a very huge smattering of both Sansevieria and Dracaena proper. If you look up the original Sansevieria range, or if you look up all those species, they're African, they're South and East African species. They're native to scrublands, arid places, deserts, sometimes really, you know, places that don't get a lot of rain. And so it's very interesting to me how I've noticed the hort industry sells them as, oh, these are great low light plants. These are yeah. low light plants. Let's get into that. Yeah. So like the truth is they're not low light plants. They're just, and this is going to hurt some people. They're just really slow to die. That's why they're marketed as low light plants. It's not because they like low light because a lot of people like to anthropomorphize. They're not low light loving plants. They're low light tolerant plants. Yes. And you'll notice if you grow a snake plant in low light, you'll notice the new leaves that come out of the center of the crown or the rosette. You'll notice they will get paler and paler if it is being grown under less than ideal light conditions. If you're not giving it enough light, the new growth is going to be smaller. It's going to be more spindly. It's going to be more pale. And honestly, snake plants are full direct sun plants. They get blasted by hot African direct sun, which is very, very hot and very, very direct. And they get burnt to a crisp, you know, into, and, and they have very thick skin and very like, an interesting shape and morphology to help survive that desert. So if, if you don't mind, I'd like to talk about how they survive. So let's talk about their structure. So what you see above the ground, a lot of people get confused because they're like, where's the stem? Or maybe they think the leaf is the stem. The stem is actually underground. It's called a rhizome. When a stem is growing underground, it's called a rhizome. You know, other rhizomes you might know, ginger is a rhizome. So the ginger you buy in the store, that's a rhizome. Irises grow off of rhizomes. If you've ever gardened outdoors, you know, the iris rhizome, it's really an underground stem. And what you see poking out of the ground is really a branch. So that branch happens to be 
a boatload of leaves. And eventually at some point it will terminate in a flower spike. Some of them are determinant, which means each rosette will flower once and then that it just kind of hangs out there and just doesn't do anything. Some are indeterminant, which means they'll keep flowering or they'll keep growing off of the same branch over a long period of time and they'll just never stop growing. So they have this underground stem and they have these, these rosettes or like crown, you could say, of leaves. And in the desert, they store their water both in their leaves as well as underground in that rhizome. They store water wherever they can. They're very efficient. And a lot of them are very thick and glossy to help shield themselves from the light, to seal the water inside. Now, again, a lot of people spritz their snake plants. One, they're from a desert, so they have no defense against foliar fungi, which is why when you buy a lot of them, they're usually like many of them have like infections or brown spots or whatever. They're not designed to get really water on their leaves because in their environment, they don't get water on their leaves. And I think one big thing that people misunderstand, especially with spritzing, is that plants absorb 99.99999% of their water through their roots. There are exceptions, like there are Tillandsia, which have specialized hairs on their leaves and they absorb through their leaves. There's those and other epiphytes, like some orchids, Tillandsia, air plants, things like that. They'll absorb through their leaves somewhat, but they will still absorb a majority through their roots. Snake plants absorb everything through their roots. So if you want to water a snake plant, you have to water the roots. I mean, you could toss water on the leaves if you want. I mean, the plants just kind of kind of stare at you and be like, oh, I hope I don't get infected. <laughs> If you have the travel bug, if you dream of seeing the cities and plants of the world, I have a great podcast recommendation to add to your listening roster plan, friend. It's called Women Who Travel from Condé Nast Traveler, and it's a podcast for anyone who loves to explore places both close and far from home. Join host Lale Arikaglu, who has a particularly delightful voice and British accent, each week as she shares her 10 years of experience as an endlessly curious and passionate global journalist, as well as the story stories of self-identifying women travelers from around the globe. Though travel and adventure has historically been publicly claimed by men, Women Who Travel creates a space for anyone excited about global issues and traveling. From the depths of the Patagonian wilderness to walks through Europe's oldest cities, Women Who Travel immerses you in the travel experience featuring sound from around the world alongside guest interviews and listener-submitted audio diaries. This tableau of sound brings the inspiration and joy of this community of travelers to wherever you're listening from. Women Who Travel is available now wherever you listen to podcasts. And these plants in nature, so because they're in these deserts, they're getting a big desert rainfall, and then they're getting periods of drought. That's right. So those roots are absorbing everything. They're either storing it in the rhizomes and roots or storing it in the leaves. And then the soil is pretty much drying out before there's another rain. Exactly. And the cool thing about them too, is they also have like an alternative form of photosynthesis. It's called cam photosynthesis. I don't know if some of them have C4, but I'm, I'm fairly certain most of them have cam or mo nearly all of them have. It's called cam photosynthesis. It's chrysulian acid metabolism. And all it is, is normal photosynthesis involves a lot of water loss. Cam photosynthesis helps reduce water loss by basically having the plant close its pores in the daytime and open its pores at nighttime, which is where we get that whole, oh, snake plants release oxygen at night. It's not that they produce oxygen at night. They actually produce oxygen in the daytime. It's really just they release it. Think of it this way. They're holding their breath all day and then their pores open and they're like, oh, and they actually do gas exchange at night because not only are they storing water in their leaves, they're storing basically air in their leaves. If you, if you want to think of it like the air is dissolved into their goo, it's dissolved into their water, it's dissolved into their guts. Like seltzer water has air in it and it's dissolved in the water and then it just like, like it bubbles out once you, you know, crack it open. Snake plants, you know, while they don't bubble when you crack them, they do still store oxygen specifically and carbon dioxide specifically in, in various forms. I know malic acid is one of the forms but they do their gas exchange at night. They hold their breath in the daytime, but they take that carbon dioxide that they sequestered or they gathered at nighttime and using the power of the sun and photosynthesis during the daytime, they convert it to oxygen. They're still holding their breath because if a plant opens its pores in the daytime, it will lose water. So 
in a hot desert environment, that's something you don't want to do. So it evolved to do that. Okay. Exactly. Interesting. So the basic things to know there are these plants. I mean, for me, when we were just in Costa Rica on our honeymoon, I mean, seeing the way snake plants are just like in the hedges, you know, of our hotel, or if you have to go, you know, you go out to California, snake plants are used in landscaping. They're like baking under the sun, very happy flowering. So I think that's a, that was one of my biggest takeaways when I realized that was snake plants deserve to be in the windowsill, not in the darkest corner of your house. And I feel like that's the biggest mistake people make with snake plants because their structure, like because they have these long, gorgeous leaves, because they can come in larger sizes, you can put them in a nice large pot, like that fills a space in a corner so beautifully. And I think they're suited for corners of a room, but usually corners has the least light availability. So it's interesting. So yeah, I've been on a mission and talking about light, you know, I've moved 400 times this year. And so I've taken my plant collection with me and I had this Sansevieria moonshine, which is a species of, of snake plant that has these really beautiful white leaves, like almost white. It's more like a mint. I would say it's like a mint green color. In my old apartment, I had it under a grow light. Then I had it in my Southern facing windowsill and it made these like beautiful chubby mint green leaves. Then we moved and I put it in a Northern facing windowsill that didn't get a lot of light. And all of a sudden it started growing weird. It like reverted. I don't know what it reverted back to, but it started growing leaves that didn't look like the original mint green leaves. They almost looked like Zelanica leaves, like a little bit of variegation. And then in my new house, I put it back in a huge Western facing window still, and it's growing. So I cut those leaves off. I cut the weird looking leaves off. And I was like, we're just going to survive this until we move again. And then now it started growing its normal leaves again. And that was such an interesting, like real life lesson of the power of putting your plants in general, but snake plants in the light that they actually want. Yeah, absolutely. And that happens with more than just snake plants, you know, that happens with with any plant that has any kind of coloration or variegation like that will change depending on heat and light. So a perfect real life example. Absolutely. Yeah. So these plants want to be in high light. Can we put them in too much light? Can they burn? And what does a burn look like? There's really no such thing as a burn. I know I will get some people who say to me, well, I burned my plant. I'm like, you didn't burn your plant. It's probably something else. Like it, it could be like for the people who claim that they've quote unquote burnt a plant in the window, especially a snake plant, which is an outdoor desert plant, full African sun, right? Or full California sun. You know, it's probably the leaf was touching the window and the window just got hot. And like it got a heat burn, not a light burn. Exactly. So it's like, oh, it was touching the window and it burnt exactly where it's touching the window. That's a heat burn, not really a light burn. You know, these are full on succulents. And for those of you who like have not expanded your definition of succulents, please do so because snake plants are succulents. There's actually a lot more succulents in the plant world. That's actually an interesting way to think about it because I feel like they do, they have the same care needs as succulents, but I feel like because of marketing, like they've just been totally like changed into this. It's like putting a succulent in a low light situation. You're asking for trouble. So I feel like with the snake plants, the two things to successfully not kill one, because I also feel like snake plants are like supposed to be the plant that no one kills, but I think people kill them because you don't know what to do with them. So let's talk about watering. What's your suggestions for watering with snake plants? So just like you mentioned earlier, and you put it so beautifully, desert rains, you know, every once in a while, every once every couple of months, or maybe it's seasonal, you get a huge flood and everything floods and gets wet. And then in like a day or two, Mm -hmm. everything gets bone dry. And you want to kind of mimic that too, for your snake plant. You want to, when you water it, just like And I tell everyone this, when you water any plant, doesn't matter which plant it is, it could be an orchid, it could be a succulent, it could be a snake plant, it could be a pothos, monstera, whatever. The goal is to saturate the media because no matter where you are, wherever it rains, it always gets wet and muddy and gross and like everything is saturated. So when you water, you want to saturate as much as possible. And you want that water to like kind of stay and absorb into the soil. That's why I'm a big fan of using saucers, dishes, even bringing the plant to the sink. Like if you have a hole in the bottom of your pot, like some t- for some plants, I'll just bring it to my sink. I'll put the sink on the shower setting, 
set it to lukewarm water and I'll just like let it flow through the pot for a couple of minutes. Like that's a great way to water. I think you and I both spoke about watering before. Like if you're a newer listener, you must go back. Chris and I did the most <laughs> epic interview on Watering 101, one of the top downloaded episodes of the show. It's it's truly an amazing deep dive. And Chris, you know, it's interesting because we on um, that episode, we talked about fully saturating, giving it that rain and letting the water drip out of the pot. Now, this isn't a mistake I made in the olden days of my plant killer and even like the beginning of my plant enthusiast. If you don't have the plant in the enough light, and you give it that saturation that it needs, and then you put it back in a low light situation, it's going to (laughs) rot because it's not going to use the water enough. And so that's another reason why lighting is so important. And I'm, I'm still learning that lesson five years in, you know? (laughs) Oh yeah. I mean, there's a couple of plants that I'm just like, I sort of tested their limits. I'm just like, well, I kind of want you over here just to see how you'll do. And then they they don't do well. And then I'm like, okay, you get to go back to the window now. You, you, You've served uh, your country. You've served me very well. Now you get to go back into the window. Interesting about snake plants too. When they want water, they will start to wrinkle a little bit. And most succulents do this. Nearly all succulents do this. Is If you see the leaves, if you see them start to get a little floopy, if you see them to get wrinkly, if you see the plant physically get smaller, mm-hmm. like, I know it's a slow process over time. You may not notice it, but you know, If you see wrinkled leaves, especially like parallel to the direction of the leaf, you know, they they go along the grain, as we say, those are water stress. It's not getting enough water. Now, that could be your plant is dry. Hopefully it's because your plant is dry, but it could also be from like, you know, root rot, like, oh, maybe you did overwater and put it in a dark corner and now it's still wrinkly. Now, don't get me wrong. Those wrinkles don't go away overnight. It's several successive waterings of a little bit of excess water or a little more frequent watering that will make those go away. And if the plant is getting enough water, that is one of the triggers for it to actually bloom, which by the way, snake plants have really wacky looking flowers and they are fragrant. They're actually pleasantly fragrant. Um, When you're in the desert, you catch more flies with honey than you do with vinegar. So if you want to catch a fly, you have to be very, or a pollinator really, You have to be very fragrant, which they are. They're very fragrant. And you have to be a nice, sweet fragrance to lure all the, because you got to think about it in a desert, there's not that many organisms that could pollinate you. So you have to be, so one, you have to not be picky. And two, you have to be nice Mm -hmm. to whoever comes by your way, because you don't know when the next pollinator is going to come by. So a lot of them have green flowers, which are like, you know, if you're into that, it's kind of wacky. Some of them have white flowers. Some of them have actually yellow flowers, depending on the species. Most hybrids have like a white green and they smell kind of jasmine-y, uh, or at least the ones I've smelled are kind of jasmine That was a listener question. How do you get a snake plant to flower? Is it just really putting it in enough light? A member of the garden party wrote in and said, do they only flower when they're stressed? What makes them flower? The Sansevieria are not a stress flowering kind of plant. They're actually a happy flowering kind of plant. So you need to be giving them a lot of light. So a lot of direct sun and you need to be giving them a lot of water. So the combo of both water and light will make the plant think, huh, it's late spring turning into summer. I should get my seeds out before the desert gets dry again. Let me flower now. So both of those combined plus fertilizer, because you got to think of it, the spring rains wash a bunch of nutrients down. So if you triple whammy them with direct sun, more watering than you would normally, plus fertilizer, you will get blooms out of that plant, assuming it is a large enough plant. And that's the perfect next question is uh, fertilizing. Is it a seasonal fertilizer? Is it just in the spring? What do you recommend for fertilizing schedules? Like for all of my succulents, you know, Succulents are kind of interesting because you can kind of force them to grow faster than they would normally, or you could just kind of have them sort of veg out and do their thing. Now, if you want your succulents, and this is true for all succulents, if you want them to grow faster, you just have to water them more frequently. They will continue growing. They will keep thinking it is springtime and they will Mm -hmm. keep adding more to themselves because they're opportunists. They're like, I'm going to grow as fast as possible while conditions are favorable. And then once conditions become unfavorable, they kind of like stop growing. They just, you know, they think it's summertime. They're like, okay, we have to survive the summer. We have to survive the winter, conserve, conserve, conserve. So they just kind of like, you know, we call it going dormant. I guess it's a form of dormancy. If you keep frequently watering them. And what I mean by that is the minute the soil gets bone dry, don't let it rest a week, water it again. Like the minute it gets dry. So that could be a weekly watering for some folks. I know in the summertime I was watering my succulents, maybe twice a week. 
And I got flowers and I got fruit off of my dragon tree, I uh, dragon fruit. I got flowers and fruit off of my Haworthias. And you can do that. And some species will continue to bloom for you. Others will be like, I see through your trick. It's, you know, they only bloom once. And then you have to kind of force them into dormancy and then trick them into thinking it's spring again if you want those blooms again. So some will keep going. I know Echeveria will just keep going. They're kind of weedy like that. They're like, oh, keep flowering. But like snake plants, I think are relatively seasonal. Like you can trick them maybe two, three times a year to bloom, sometimes even four times a year. It's just a matter of like, they need at least a month of good conditions and then they'll bloom. And then, you know, you can like dry them out or like keep it drier between waterings. And then like, you know, for like another month or two, it just sort of trick them into thinking, oh, it's summertime or it's wintertime or whatever. And then you can bring on the rains again. But as long as those three basic conditions are met, the direct sun, the more frequent waterings and the fertilizer, then you're you're bound to get blooms or at least a bigger plant or pups or something. Like if it doesn't bloom, it's gonna it's gonna at least make some pups or something. Plant friends, if you are looking for an easy, sustainable hanging planter that looks gorgeous and is super functional, you should totally try the Wally Grow Loop. We were first introduced to Wally Grow for their eco planters, which are their brilliant solution to effortlessly creating the green wall of your dreams. I've used them in several of my homes to build green walls, and I talked about them in last week's ad. But today I want to tell you about their newer planter invention called the Loop. So if you've ever done hanging planters with macrame, you know the struggle that comes with juggling the macrame, the saucers, the planters, trying to water at weird angles. And the loop is Wally Grow's answer to all of those struggles. They've really up-leveled the whole design concept of a hanging planter and made it super simple, super cute, and leak-proof, which is amazing. So the loop is essentially a cash post system. So it's a planter that has two shells, an inner shell that has 360 degrees of drainage, and then an outer non-leak shell that you put that inner shell in. And you can water by either bottom watering it in that outer shell or watering it through the water reservoir that the planter has. Plus, the design is super sleek and so versatile. It comes in so many different colors and all the shades are really beautiful. And there's all sorts of different ways to hang it. And they have all sorts of tutorials. They make it super easy for you to do. You can hang it on the wall from your ceiling, or you can do what I've been doing lately and actually remove the cord and use it as a tabletop planter. So as I record this ad for you, I have a beautiful queen of the night cactus living its best life in a white loop that sits on my desk. I've been using them as tabletop planters because they're leak proof and they're super sleek. We're living in a furnished home right now. And when we move to our next home, I want to do like a whole wall of the hanging loop planters. So if you want to grab a few, Wally Grow is actually offering discounted mix and match color options, which would be perfect for gift giving. And speaking of gifts, they also have four inch plants to go with the loops. So you could actually gift a full loop plant combo, which would make for such a cute and fun gift. So, plant friends, Wally Grow rarely offers discount codes, and they're offering us a limited time discount code. You should check them out not only for the eco planters for a green wall, the loop planters that I just talked about for a hanging planter, but also they just launched an amazing home line of planty dish towels, burp cloths, swaddles, and even pillowcases that have gorgeously planty prints on them. I just gifted my friend who's a new mom some of the burp cloths, which were so cute. So Wally Grow is offering this limited time 15% discount code to Bloom and Grow listeners from November 9th through the 23rd only. So if you want that discount code, take advantage of it while you can at wallygrow.com, wallygrow.com, and use code MARIA15 at checkout for 15% off. Plant friends, whether you live in a teensy tiny apartment or a big old house, Modern Sprout offers simple, stylish, and sustainable green thumb solutions for every home. And plant friends, it's the holiday season and they have seriously giftable planty products for everyone. Whether you have ultra beginner gardeners in your life or the most experienced plant enthusiasts, or maybe you're the plant enthusiast building out your own gift list. So Black Friday is coming and they offer their largest discount of the year on Black Friday, 30% off. So because of that, I want to talk about their higher priced items in case you want to take advantage of that amazing discount. So obviously those are going to be their smart app enabled grow lights. I have been using their grow lights in my home for years. You've probably seen them in my grow light tours on my YouTube channel or on my Instagram. I installed their smart grow bar in my bookshelf a couple of years ago. I was obsessed with it. I liked it so much. I did it again. And I turned my bookcase into a highlight haven for plants. 
I also loved their gorgeous brass grow house, which you can plant directly in, or you can put three, four inch pots inside of it. I've had it on my kitchen countertop and on my desktop before. And the thing about all of their grow lights, because they have lots of different models, is their grow lights are fully customizable and connect with the cool Mod Sprout app. So they're smart app enabled. So on the app, you can either choose their preset settings. So you can choose partial shade, partial sun, or full sun, or you can fully customize your lighting schedule. So when we had our grow shelf in our bedroom, I customized the lighting schedule to our sleep schedule so the lights would go off as we went to sleep. And their lights are full spectrum grow lights that emit a soft, natural white light, and they're designed to integrate seamlessly into their home. And talking about seamlessly, I am loving their uplift planter. I'm looking at it right now. I have it in my office. It's their elevated plant stand that has an adjustable stand and removable full spectrum LED grow light on top of it. It's so cool. It's black. It's super sleek. It has this watertight planter that's elevated on a plant stand and then this beautiful little grow light hanging on top of it. It's super cute and it's perfect for dark corners. I have it in the corner of my office. Another one of their higher ticket items that I have to say, if you're looking to get a discount on it, is their three liter watering can. You know, I talk about it all the time. It's like the cutest, silliest thing for me to be obsessed with, but I totally am because it's super sleek and holds a lot of water and has that nice, sexy, skinny spout just like I like. So to take advantage of our coupon code on a daily basis for their grow lights or any of their amazing planty accessories or planters or grow kits, use code BLOOM21 at checkout for 15% off. But if you hold out for Black Friday, you can get a whopping 30% off. And no, you can't use our coupon code on Black Friday. So to check out their amazing line of grow lights, accessories, and grow kits, head over to modsprout.com and use code BLOOM21 at checkout. And um, anything we need to know about potting media, I would assume because they're desert plants, you want a nice aerated potting, uh, potting mix. So can I confess something? Absolutely. Always. So I, I, oh, I go online because, you know, I'm at the botanical gardens and I, you know, I teach there. So I have to like go and I have to make sure that everyone is, you know, all the information online I'm aware of. So that way I can prepare for questions. And so what's interesting is I have come across so many sites that are like, you need three parts coconut choir and one part perlite and this part, this for the perfect mix for your sense of area. And I'm just like... <laughs> <laughs> and there's like 50 of these websites, all with their own quote unquote proprietary. I know mix. everybody's very fancy. Making your own potting mix is very in vogue right now. And I'm just like sitting back and I'm just like, you know, in Florida, we just dump them in like succulent mix or we just dump them in like regular potting soil, which is like for me, like regular potting soil is fine. Those fancy mixes are fine. They kind of will grow anywhere as long as they dry out fast enough in between waterings and they don't sit in water for like more than a day, then they really don't care what they grow in. Just as long, I think it sounds like what's more important is that there's a hole in the bottom of the pot and the water exits the media and they don't sit in sopping wet. Right. Like they should sit for like a day so that the media fully absorbs the water and becomes fully saturated. But like after that, like dump any excess, let it fully dry out. I mean, if it's in direct sun indoors anyway, the sun should cook the rest of the water out of the pot in the next couple of days anyway. So you should be good. It's interesting. I got the majority of my snake plants in the beginning of plant parenthood of my plant enthusiast journey. And, uh, I didn't even know there were different types of potting mixes at that point. I thought you got one bag of potting mix, my Espoma general potting mix that I potted everything up. And then I realized, oh, there is cactus mix. There is African violet mix. And now I have a little fun with it, but yeah, I feel like it's, as long as you're buying like a bagged mix, you know, I feel like you're, you're okay. Most desert plants are not picky about what they're planted in. They're, they're opportunists and they're survivalists. Like some of them grow in between rocks, which is why sometimes growing in Lekka makes sense. Not my cup of tea to grow things in Lekka, but it makes sense because they can, and they can grow in like sand and gravel, or like they could grow by, maybe there's a desert river they grow by. And some of them do. And they're just like, wow, this is really rich soil over here. I'm going to grow really great. So they're opportunists. They, They really don't care what they're potted in. So I'd love to troubleshoot with you because I put this in the garden party platform. We had so many people write in with, with problems and questions. They want to troubleshoot with you. Most of the questions are about pups and droopy snake plants. So I will confess, you've confessed. I will confess when I was starting out, I had some snake plants gifted to me and they were, now that I look back, I understand that 
I thought that I needed to repot them because I had them for a year or so. And everybody says repot every couple of years, right? They were not that root bound. There was significant roots, but they weren't totally pot bound. And so I separated the pups. There were crazy. I mean, it was like a full eight inch pot of, of snake plants. I separated the pups. I repotted them and the pups did not do as well as the mom, because I think like I probably over potted the pups and then the plants, like some of them made it, some of them didn't, and it wasn't great. So I feel like there is an art and science to propagating the pups and setting them up for success. And many people wrote in asking about that. So could you kind of walk us through how we should approach pups and when the right time to separate them is, and then what's the best practice for repotting them? Yeah. So like I mentioned, snake plants have an underground stem called a rhizome. And what really what we're calling a pup is just another branch off of that rhizome. So really, when you're um, separating these pups or when you're thinking about separating these pups, you're really just breaking the stem or you're breaking branches off of a tree. It's just kind of a very weird sideways tree that's half underground and the branches are above ground facing one direction. You know, it's, it's wacky, but that's how plants are. So. When you divide, I call it dividing because it's, it's not taking a cutting, it's, it's dividing. I am pretty rough because I know what I'm dealing with. I just find the umbilical cord, so to speak, or which is really the rhizome, the connection, the stem. I just snip it or I just rip it apart in the center. But what I'll do is before I plant it, I won't plant it immediately. In fact, I'll let it sit out for a couple of hours because the best thing you can do when you're propagating, and this is for any propagation, is let the wound seal, let the wound cauterize. Because when you repot, you have to water. And if you water and this thing has an open wound, that's like me going into a river with an open wound. I don't know if piranhas are going to eat me, but there's definitely bacteria that are going to get into my wound. And the same thing happens with the plants. And I think that I have a very old school trick and a lot of people like look at me like I have five heads whenever I do it. I take actually a cigarette lighter and I just burn. I literally cauterize and I burn the wound so that it seals faster. I still leave it out for like an hour so that it can like dry, dry, but I burn the wound so that it can, it can seal faster. And it also sterilizes it and, you know, helps it out. And nearly all of my propagations that I've done that to have been successful. I've done that let it dry out. Yeah, the roots get a little crunchy, which they're not supposed to, but oh, well, it'll grow new roots because it has enough of that rhizome Mm -hmm. in order to grow new roots. So, you know, you take the pup, you want to make sure the pup is big enough too. I know there's some people who are propagation crazy and they will propagate something the minute they see it. I'm like, no, no. Yeah. How tall should the pup grow before you separate it? I would say like a solid, like three inches tall above the ground plant with like at least four or five leaves. Same thing for like an orchid keiki. It's like, you know, three inches tall, about four or five leaves. And and it has its own root system. So when you dig it up, make sure that the part you're separating has a couple of little dangly roots off of it. Because if it does, then you're going to save yourself a lot of trouble. If you try to pull it off too soon, or if you try to rip it off and it doesn't have any roots, you're going to stress it out. It may or may not survive. It may not have the energy to grow the roots. You know, it, all bets are off. I think that's what I did way back when. I don't think I paid attention to the pups all having their own established root structure. So you're going to let them grow till four inches. Then you're going to cut through the rhizome, pop them up. What size pot? Because now we have to think about this is such a small root structure. We're potting it into a pot and we don't want the roots to sit in too much soil because then that soil isn't going to dry out fast enough. Depending on, I guess, the size of the pup, like what size pot should that be going into? The real answer is a long winded answer, but I'm going to try to like cut it down as best as I can. So like in the universe, in nature, there is no pot size. They just grow and they have all the space in the world. So you could say that the universe is over potting, right? or they are overpotted in nature, quote unquote, right? So for me, I purposefully overpot certain plants. I'll, you know, overpot my division. So for example, like for a three or four inch snake plant division, I'll pot it in like a five inch pot, which like, you know, most people would be like, you should put it in a three or a four. And I'm like, yeah, I could put it in a three or four, but I also know my own watering habits. I am a chronic underwaterer. I know that if I put it in a larger pot, it will stay moister for longer because it has more, you know, media to draw water from. If you are good with your watering, I'm not, I forget all the time. 
and you do water more frequently or you see it more frequently or you don't have 50 million plants in your apartment like I do, so you can pay attention to that specific mm -hmm. one, you know, you will want to go with a smaller pot size. And then just like a shoe as it grows, you know, you go one to two inches up each time that you repot it. But I purposefully give it a larger pot because I know I'm a chronic underwaterer. And also it's trying to grow. You want it to establish itself. So you do want it to be a little more moist. So that way it still thinks it's springtime. It still thinks it can establish itself because the worst thing you can do is like dry it out and keep it dry. Like you can let it dry between waterings, just like you would for the mama plant. Again, the care is no different. The only difference is, is that you want it to be a little more moist or you want to water a little more frequently so that it can establish itself. So it thinks it's springtime. It's still triggered to grow and it will grow and establish. And then once it's established, after maybe a couple of months, then you could treat it exactly like the mother plant, you know, dry it, let it dry out, let it be all succulenty and, and, and such. I hope that makes sense. Yeah, totally. So what about another thing that uh, several people were super curious about is a droopy snake plant. So what happens when you start getting some on droopy looking leaves. I mean, the snake plant leaves are supposed to be straight as an arrow right up in the air. And this has definitely happened to me before. Some droopy leaves. How can we troubleshoot that? I'm going to disappoint you. <laughs> you have to learn to love the plant for what it is. And it is a fact that when the leaves get to a certain size, they will not be able to support themselves under their own weight. So they just kind of floop and droop. And that's just how they are. There's nothing wrong with the plant. There's literally nothing you did. There's nothing wrong with the plant. I mean, there are kinds of drooping that is associated with like disease or whatever, but I'm assuming if you're taking care of the plant and everything's fine and it's getting the sun and the light and the water that it needs and it's not wrinkly, but it's still kind of like bends. I would call it bending rather than drooping. Like it bends like, you know, maybe it's straight up about two or three feet and then it bends on the fourth foot and then it kind of dangles a little. That's just the nature of the plant. That's just how that plant grows. Now, there is a trick that you can do if you want less bendy leaves or fewer bendy leaves, I should say. Okay. It's more light because more light will help strengthen the integrity of each individual leaf. And so that will help keep them and, and keeping them well watered too, so that they don't start to bend in the first place. Because again, they don't have wood. So how do they support themselves? It's really water pressure. Again, I, I think I may have mentioned this in the water episode, plants are big water balloons and the more pressure they have, the, the less floopy they will be. But you will get to a point where your snake plant is like five feet tall and it will start to bend. And that's just natural. And you just have to love it for what it is. Gotcha. I want to read a listener question regarding this. They said, I recently rescued a snake plant from a friend who severely overwatered it for about two months. When I received it, it had lots of yellow leaves and some were dried up and dead. I repotted it from the soggy soil and split it into two pots. I know that there was root damage, so I added healthy root tea. I have it in an east window that gets limited morning sun for two hours and stays bright all day. I'm watering when the soil is completely dry. The remaining leaves are still bent over. Will they ever go upright or will they always be floppy? Should I propagate the floppy leaves? Any other tips for helping this plant return to its former beauty? Yeah, I mean, once the leaves floop or flop, they, they, they floop or flop forever. And like I said before, you have to love the plant for what it is. You can propagate the plant. The cool thing about snake plants and ZZ plants are like this too, which is weird because they're not even related is you can propagate just about any part of the snake plant. You can take a leaf cutting, assuming it's healthy because you don't want to take like a sick leaf and propagate that. Who wants to make more sick things? You know, you take a perfectly healthy leaf, you cut the perfectly healthy leaf, cauterize the wound, or just kind of let it dry out. I wouldn't use the lighter in that case. I would just let it air dry and then plant it in moist soil and treat it as if you had taken just a propagation and it will try to reroot itself. And because it's from one leaf cutting, it'll be rigid. The new growth will be rigid because it is small and you can get like a nice, more upright plant. Or the alternative is don't grow Laurentiis. And I know, I know exactly like most my people. My favorite yeah. species, my favorite I'm of sorry, all. I'm <laughs> sorry, Laurentiis and a few other species and their hybrids, they just naturally floop. There are other ones that do not floop, but they are not necessarily as upright. There are some that never floop, but that's because they are very squat. There are some that never floop, but that's because they never get big enough to floop. There are some miniature species that like 
their maximum height is like 18 inches and that's it. And it's like, okay, well, that's cool. I like that. It just stays pokey and upright and it never gets bigger. Great. (laughs) Well, okay. So we had another listener question and let me see if I want to see if my answer is right or not. And then you can either correct me or agree with me. So another person wrote in saying, Hey, how do I get my plants to grow bigger and bushier? And another life lesson I learned from my plant collection is I was gifted a, one of my favorite species would recommend, it's a tiny plant called the Sansevieria samurai. And it's this tiny chubby, I mean, it's chubby leaves, like almost rose gold outline on each leaf. It's a gorgeous, and I have it in a two inch pot. It's tiny. And the leaves were pretty small when it was shipped to me. It was in a two inch pot. I stuck it in my Southern facing windowsill and the leaves doubled in size. So the bottom of the plant is these like tinier leaves. And then once it got in my windowsill, it like has, it's like a tiny bottom and then like a much bigger top. So was that the light? Was it that I put it in a highlight situation? So it grew a little bit chubbier and bushier, or is that just pure coincidence? In your case specifically, yes, it was the light and more light will cause them to grow more full, more, more chunkier, but like I don't want folks to think that this is a bushy plant. It's just not in the nature of the plant itself to be bushy. Oh, that's an interesting point. That's an interesting, I think fuller, maybe this garden party member was maybe meaning fuller instead of bushier, like with more pups Okay, yeah, something. like if you want it to be more, if you want more leaves, then yeah, more light, more leaves. Absolutely. They'll be, you know, closer together. They'll be thicker, fuller, whatever. But also like pay attention to which cultivar or species or whatever you're growing too, because like some, like the Laurentii are meant to bend and floop and kind of sprawl everywhere. Others like Sansevieria gracilis, which is one of my favorite species. It actually is just a tiny thing. It kind of looks like one of those like octopus talansias. Like literally it looks like an octopus talansia. It has beautiful lime green variegation if you can find a variegated one. And it's got like little ridges on it. It's like, it's a gorgeous plant. But like that one's kind of bushy. There are other species that just kind of, they grow in a compact way. Like when they have pups, the pups are very close to the mother plant. So it gives that bushier feeling. But if you're going for something that looks like a bush, grow a bush. (laughs) Yeah, fair. And um, along those lines, what are your favorite species? You mentioned you like this gracilis version. What snake plants are you liking right now? So I love gracilis. I'm actually um, trying to acquire one right now. It's I it, it's in my cart. I just haven't clicked order yet. <laughs> I do the thing where like I put it in my cart and I see if I still like it. Yeah, I let it marinate. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah. um Sansevieria gracilis, gorgeous plant. It looks like a Tillandsia, it loves bright light. Sansevieria fisheri or fisheri is it, it's it's a small chonker. It's just squat and it's a <laughs> chonker. I squat, love it. It's fat. It's, you know, some would call it ugly. I think it's beautiful. Okay. Gorgeous. <laughs> I think it's beautiful. <laughs> okay. What else? There's um, Sansevieria Cleopatra. That's just a gorgeous plant. It has beautiful striking pattern. It's like very contrasty. If you like contrast and like, mm-hmm. you know what it looks like? An old fashioned TV. You know how it would have the snow? Yeah. It's variegation looks like green, white snow. It's, oh, it's cool. so, but okay. like a little more streaky. It's like, it's so like wild like that. And there's also Sansevieria. It's called Copper Tone. It's a hybrid or whatever. Sansevieria Copper Tone. It's like a brown penny colored Sansevieria. It's kind of like how a lithops is supposed to look like a stone. That Sansevieria is from the hard desert. And if you live in the hard desert, you want to do your best to look as much like a rock and the ground as possible, or Mm. everybody's going to eat you because they know that there's juice inside of you and there's no water out there. So it's beautiful. It's like, it's like copper colored. It's got like brown and white. I've never heard of it before. Oh, it's, it's Google pictures of it. It's, it's a gorgeous plant and it deserves to be in like every collection ever. It's like, it's like a lithops. It's just supposed to blend. It looks like camouflage. I can't praise it enough. I love it. Okay. I also have, which I've had for a long time, a bantle sensation. But one thing I will say about the bantle snake, which I think is the one with the white stripes, right? Bantle's the one with the white stripes. If I'm remembering this correctly. Yeah. They have a habit of reverting. They have a really nasty habit of reverting. They're gorgeous the way they are, but I've noticed even with the light, they will still try to revert. But if you give them enough heat they'll keep the variegation. So if you let them get cold, 
And I've said this for years, variegation is part heat, part light. If you chill them out or if they're in too chilly of a window, they will try to revert and they'll start looking like a Zelenica or one of the other ones or whatever, like the kind of normal green snake plants. But you can keep the white. And I've noticed mine has tried to revert a couple of times. I just cut off the reversions. Sometimes you can grow them together where like, you know, the non- variegated plant will feed the variegated plant because they're still connected. And I do that actually with my Monstera too. I have a variegated Monstera. One branch has reverted, but I just let that branch live because I'm like, you're going to make food for the other. To right. Photosynthesize baby. Right, 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 right. That's great. Anyway, uh, the Bantle sensations, they, they have a habit of reverting. The Laurentii, which I know you love, is very disease susceptible. So that's that's the downside of Laurentii. It floops when it gets okay. too big and it's disease susceptible, but it's just so easy to grow and propagate and, and it's fun and it comes in all these different colors. So what's not to love about it? It's just keep the leaves dry. Other Sansevieria are more resistant to leaf fungi, which is great, but like Laurentii and kind of like the sort of like... Um, I don't know how you'd describe them, like the tape looking ones. You know how their leaves are very flat, like it's like tape or paper, not, not paper flat, but like like this could be a banner or a band of something, if I'm describing this right, versus like others are more chunky or they're more like, you know, the, the skin is much thicker and those will be more resistant to um, fungi as well. So, and then there's the cylindricas, which are just, cylindricas will just keep growing. They'll just keep growing until eventually they just like collapse under their own weight. Cylindricas are great. I love the cylindrical ones. I think they're so interesting. And uh, I don't have one. I'm definitely probably going to add one to my collection because they're just so unique. And we will put all of the correct spelling for the Latin names and photos in the blog and on the YouTube channel for, for people to check these out in case they get a little curious. This was kind of a good combination of favorite and lesser known species. One other thing I feel like people or that I see in a lot and I feel like I'm kind of famous and now Billy has gotten into the habit of like when you're in a doctor's waiting office, I'll go to the bathroom and like damp in a paper towel because the leaves attract so much dust. Yeah, I feel like mate, remembering to like give your Sansevieras a wipe down once a quarter or something um, because man, those big, flat, nice leaves, oh, yeah. I feel like just suck dirt and dust. And sometimes like when I clean those leaves off, I'm mortified at how covered in shit these poor plants are, you know? Oh yeah. And they actually pull the dust out of the air. Plants are dust clings. They plants have an electrical charge. Dust has a slight static charge. Do you remember? I don't know if you remember, I might age myself here. Do you remember those commercials, those late night commercials where they have the like the static air filter? It's like this big thing you plug in. It's like a tower you used to plug in and it would have two metal plates and it would run the electricity through the metal plates. And then you'd have all the dust would cling to it and you'd have to like take it out and take it to your sink and like wipe it off. And like, just like, do you remember those? I don't think so, but I'm sure we have listeners that do. Yeah. Well, they used to be like, it's one of those like as seen on TV type, like, you know, it's like, it's like one of those, like, you know. And to myself, I'm like, you know, you know, it's junk I spend money on. <laughs> I'm a victim for that stuff. I'm just like, oh my God, I love it so much. But we had one of those or my family had one of those. We quickly threw it out because we're like, this doesn't do anything. The plant actually gathered more dust than the contraption did. So we just stuck with plants. So, you know, that's a life lesson. <laughs> totally. Well, to wrap up, what life lessons can we learn from Sansevierias? I feel like they're so, what's the word I want to say? I feel like they're a great plant to learn a lot of lessons on because they're very forgiving. I feel like when I think about all of the dark corners, I put my poor snake plants in when I think about how many times I've greatly underwatered them and they just kind of truck through and they're like, okay, Maria, like we'll forgive you for this one. We'll keep going. We won't totally poop out on you. I feel like they're a wonderful lesson in resilience, you know? Resiliency and stoicism. I would call them stoic plants. Ooh, I love that, Chris. Stoicism. I love that. So beautiful. Well, Chris, it's always so fun to have you on the show. Thanks for always joining me whenever I shoot you an email. Where can everyone find you and the growing Botanic Tonic brand? Yes. So I am Botanic Tonic, the NYC plant doctor. I work also at the New York Botanical Gardens where I'm an instructor there. 
So you can actually take my classes if you're in New York or even the virtual ones too. You can take any of my classes at the New York Botanical Gardens. You just go onto the website, you sign up and you get me. You can find me also. I answer plant questions also on Botanic Tonic on Instagram, Botanic Tonic, B-O-T-A-N-I-C-T-O-N-I-C. And I also have a website and that's where I post a bunch of care sheets and things like that. That is nycplantdoctor.com. I think botanictonic.com mm-hmm. also works. I have a few URLs that like direct to it. That so all like, redirect. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, or, or you could just Google my name, Chris Satch, and I'll come up in like 50 different places. You, you, you'll find me. We'll put all the links in the show notes. All you got to do is open the show notes for what you're listening to. And Chris will be there. So go check Chris out, follow him on all of his media. And um, thanks again, Chris, for always joining us. Thank you so much. It's always a pleasure to be here. And I love talking plants with you. Oh, me too, my plant friend. All right, until next time, until the next one. Until next time. Thank you so much to Chris. He's such a beloved friend. He's really a guest that's turned into a sweet plan friend. And I love watching his brand grow. And I'm so thankful for all the time that he's given to us and our community of listeners as he helps educate us. So thank you, Chris. And you should go follow Chris on all of his channels. Check out his blog. You can check out the blog for this episode if you're curious on seeing photos of the snake plants that we mentioned and getting those names again. And plan friends, Put a snake plant in the light that it needs and deserves, okay? Stick a snake plant in your window and you're going to be blown away with how happy they are, just like that Sansevieri moonshine I was talking about. Holiday season is upon us, plant friends. I hope that you've got some fun plans. I hope you've got love in your life. I hope you've got plants in your life. I hope you're using plants to find more moments of love and joy and fun in your life. And until next time, my sweet plant friends, keep blooming and keep growing. Plant friend, thank you for tuning in today. If you like what you heard, make sure you're subscribed to the show so you never miss an episode. And while you're there subscribing, why don't you click over to the review section and leave us a review? It would be tremendously helpful for the show. So thanks in advance. If you're looking for more planty content or ways to help and support the show or engage with our community, we've got a ton of options for you. So first, there's the free Bloom and Grow Plant Parent Personality Test. It is a super fun three-minute test that I made for you that pairs you with your Plant Parent Personality Profile, where you'll learn your planty strengths and weaknesses and get a curated list of plants, projects, and podcast episodes that are right up your alley tailored just for you. The test lives at Bloom and growradio.com slash personality and you have to let me know what your results are on Instagram. You can find me on Instagram at Bloom and Grow Radio. If you're interested in supporting Bloom and Grow Radio, consider becoming a Patreon plant friend of the show. Patreon plant friends are members of the community who support the show monetarily on a monthly basis for as little as $4 a month and these magical humans help support the show and bring our content to as many planty eyes and ears as possible. Once you join, you'll also get the secret password to our Facebook group, which I like to call the plantiest corner of the internet. We have a lot of fun over there. You can become a Patreon plant friend at patreon.com slash bloom and grow radio. And of course, you can also just join our newsletter that I like to call the Garden Club. When you join our Garden Club, you'll receive a free download of the exclusive Molly Mansfield Keep Blooming print, which is so adorable. And I'll slide into your inboxes usually only around twice a month with plant care tips, recent episodes, and announcements. You can join at bloomandgrowradio.com slash community. And for anything else, plant friends, I'm here for you. So feel free to drop me a line when you have an idea for an episode, an event, or maybe even if you're a planty business interested in sponsoring the show. Thanks again for listening. It is my honor and delight to help you keep blooming and keep growing. friends, propagate knowledge, and grow some freaking joy. That's the motto of the Growing Joy Garden Society app and platform, otherwise known as the plantiest and kindest corner of the internet. If you've been an OG listener or a longtime listener, you might also know this app and platform as the Bloom and Grow Garden Party, but with the rebrand, we've rebranded it to the Growing Joy Garden Society. No trolls allowed, kind plant friends only. And if you haven't heard about the society yet, Plant Friend, you got to join. It's my online community that you can access via iOS or Android app 
or on your computer that I built to connect our international community of plant friends so we can all nerd out together about plants and celebrate our passion for our beloved plant babies. We have members literally all over the world. I'm so in love with this community of sweet plant friends. I can't say enough amazing things about them. But also there's a lot of really cool features about the app you might be interested in. There's dedicated hashtags to all sorts of different subsects of planty passions like houseplants, gardening, plant-inspired DIY projects, growing joy, plants and pets, and so many more. There's a plantrepreneur group. So if you're a planty entrepreneur and you want to connect with other planty entrepreneurs, you can join that group to connect and network. There's a plant swap section. Plus, the entire app, and this is my favorite part, is entirely searchable. So say you want to learn more about Hoya, you type the word Hoya into the search bar and literally every post ever created about Hoya will pop up so you can click in, see what other people have been posting about Hoya and learn on your own and crowdsource hair information. It's so cool. But last but not least, it's an amazing way to support the show. Your monthly membership not only goes to sustaining the platform, but it also supports my team of editors, writers, and a community manager that help the world of Bloom and Grow keep growing. So come join us. All you got to do is go to jointhegardensociety.com and sign up for the community plan. Once again, you go to jointhegardensociety.com and click the community plan. Hot take plant friends, there is no one right starter plant. There, I said it. And you know what? While I'm at it, there are also no real plant killers in the world. There are just people who have not figured out their right plants for their lifestyle. This is why I created the free Plant Parent Personality Test, because Plant Friend, I want you to get thriving alongside your houseplants as quickly as possible, so I made this cutie little Plant Parent Personality Quiz that's totally free for you on my website to take the guesswork out of building your plant collection effortlessly and joyfully. After speaking to thousands of members in our community, I realized that there are about five key Plant Parent Personalities, each one with their unique set of strengths, weaknesses, and a unique set of plants that thrive under their care. For example, a mindful plant parent, someone who wants to engage with their plants daily, use them in their morning routines. If someone gifted that plant parent a succulent and they watered it every day, that succulent would die immediately. However, that drought-resistant succulent is a perfect match for a low-key plant parent, which is someone who travels, has kids, is busy, doesn't have time to engage with their plants every day. They're looking to engage with their plants more like once a week or once every couple of weeks. In addition, obviously, to understanding your light and basic plant care that we provide on this podcast, Happy Plant Parenthood is all about discovering your personality and then picking the right house plants to go with it. It's that simple. No more stressing over your collection. So what plant parent personality type are you, plant friend? All you got to do to find out is take my free quiz on my website and let me know. You can access it at growingjoywithmaria.com slash personality. After taking the test, you'll get an email with a list of plants, podcast episodes, and planty projects that I think would light you specifically up like a full spectrum grow light. So once again, that's growingjoywithmaria.com slash personality for your free plant parent personality test results. Mm-hmm. 